I, uh, my, my adoptive father was Polish and he played in a folk group uh, and he had, there was a guitar lying around the house but he never played it because he had an accident where he uh, chopped off finger. So there was always a guitar knocking around the house. So I used to mess around on it. And then I guess around the age of 10, 11, it got serious. Um, the kid who lived next door uh, was about two, three years older than me. So he used to play me all this music that I'd never heard. And uh, he played me 21st century schizo man and it blew the top of my head off, you know. Uh, so then I started taking playing the guitar seriously. I decided I have to do this. This is what I have to do with my life, you know. And because um, I was adopted, there was no, I had no idea who my real parents were. But later on in life, when I was in my 20s, I found my real mother. And she was quite a famous singer in Ireland in the 40s and 50s, 50s and 60s. So there's a gen genetic component to it as well, I guess. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was, I was pretty obsessed with Robert and how Robert played, Robert Fripp. And then uh, I, read a, I read an article that Robert had written about um, the, only, the only other English guitar players he thought were really good. And one of them was a guy called Alan Holdsworth, who I'd never heard of. So that was another epiphany. I went to see him play and thought he was incredible. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Robert that you read about is not necessarily the same as the Robert that we know. Um, he's very disciplined, he practices every day. Um, he, he's very keen to always try and make it better. So each tour, <clears throat> he wants the guitars to lock in better or he wants the sounds to, so it, it's a combination of he, on the one hand, he lets you be you and I think he chooses the musicians to be in Crimson that he thinks will be the best guys to bring that music to life. And he kind of lets them do that. Uh, but there might be some very specific things, particularly the guitar, because we're sharing that role. And um, I play a lot of the older parts because in the 80s, he changed the way he tunes his guitar. He's got this thing, new standard tuning. And so some of the older songs that we do uh, are, are actually very difficult, uh, just physically, because of the spacings. So um, he makes me play those parts. So. I, I don't know, I'm not in charge of that, but I, I think we live in a very different world, you know. And historically, touring was a means, ultimately, to promote records. And, uh, of course, the industry's changed. And you, you can't make the kind of money out of selling records that you could once. So touring becomes a thing of itself. And particularly this band, you know, getting this band in one place is a very time consuming and costly business. You know, just to get us all to, into a rehearsal room costs tens of thousands of pounds, you know, because Tony lives, Tony lives in upstate New York, Pat lives in Nashville, Bill's in Seattle. You know, everybody's got to be brought, brought in. And um, so I don't know. There's always been a kind of commercialized aspect in any era. And I guess bands like Crimson live on the outside of that. And there are still plenty of bands to this day and age that live outside of it. Uh, I have a 17 year old son and quite often he'll say, I think you might like this. And he plays me this extraordinary music, some of which is brilliant. Uh, and I, I, I've never heard of these people. I don't know how I would have heard them. They, they're not played on the radio. You know, that model has gone too. You know, radio now it plays kind of predictable format. Um, so I don't know where the new music is heard. I guess it's, it's, in, a, it's in a world I, I, I have little connection with, I, I, I guess. You know. um, on the plus side, my son has no sense of tribalism. You know, he, if it's music, he likes it or he doesn't like it. Um, we were in the car the other day and he said that his two favourite bands were Everything Everything. Have you heard of them? Yeah. Yeah. He said, my two favourite bands are Everything Everything and The Beatles. And I thought, well, that's amazing, you know. To him, 
he, you know, in his head, they're not, uh, this isn't old people's music that I can't listen to. It's music and I really like it. And I really like that. And, I, and he doesn't care where it's from. He doesn't care whether it's meant to be hip or not. He just likes it. Um, and that, I like that. I like that, that, that that's become egalitarian in that sense. You know, I'm from a generation where I would have hated the music my dad liked, even if I'd liked it. You know what I mean? Because it was, it was connected to rebellion and, and newness and, and, you know, separation. Well, yeah, I, I had several, I think. Uh, I think my very first guitar hero would have been Hank Marvin from The Shadows. Uh, and then Robert, and then, yeah, well, there's loads after that. Uh, John McLaughlin, Jeff Beck. Uh, I saw Gary Moore when, I, when he was really, I mean, I was, I was about 13, and he was, he was only about four or five years older than me. Um, Alan Holdsworth. Yeah, I, there was lots of people that, it was all, it was less homogenized, you know. I listen to a lot of stuff now, and it's hard for me to tell who, one guitar player from another, but back then, they had instantly identifiable kind of sounds and approaches, you know. But I guess there was less, there was less music to consume, so that, that was another reason why it kind of worked. Uh, well, I tell you some of my favorite albums that I still think are amazing. They're not necessarily guitar albums. Uh, there's an album by Van de Graaff Generator called uh, Porn Hearts, which Robert plays on. Uh, the first album by Henry Cow, Legend, which I think has incredible writing on. Uh, and he was a very unusual guitarist, uh, Fred Frith. But in terms of guitar, you know, the first Mahavishnu Orchestra album was, was amazing. Um, all of those early Crimson albums. The thing that I miss, uh, <clears throat> Robert's acoustic playing on a lot of those albums are, is amazing. Incredible sound, incredible notes. Uh, I don't know, I saw, I remember seeing Focus when I was young, Jan Ackerman, he was very impressive. Moving Waves, I remember listening to that album. I could go on, you know. I choose the drummer I'm playing with now, which is Gavin Harrison. Uh, bass player, I don't know. I don't know. Jacko Pastorius, I guess, if he was still alive. Other guitarists? Other guitarists. I don't want to be in a band with other guitarists. <laughs> Nick Harper. Yeah, I'll tell you one story. I made an album with a man called uh, Tom Robinson. Do you know who he is? And um, very proud of the record. Thought it was very good. But it was on a small label. And um, the people promoting it were trying to get radio play, TV appearances. And I got a phone call one day and they said, we've got you a TV slot. And I said, okay, when is it? And they said, oh, it's a live show on a Friday night uh, called the James Whale Radio Show. And, I, and I'd seen this show and it's the kind of show that used to be on after the pub shut in England. And it was, it was very amateurish and throwaway. And I said, I'm not doing it. It's rubbish. I don't want to be associated with that. And then Tom phoned me up and said, please, will you do it? It's the only exposure we're going to get. Um, will you do it as a favor? So I said, all right. So on the day of that show, I begrudgingly packed my equipment and drove to Leeds, which is a couple of hundred miles away, cursing it all the way up there thinking. Of. And we get there and we do the show. Uh, I play a bit of keyboards, I sing, I play guitar, I do a solo in the middle. And then when it's done, I think, what a waste of my time this was. And I pack all my equipment away and I drive home. Three or maybe four months later, my phone rings and it's Mark King from Level 42. I've never spoken to him before in my life, don't know him. And he says, uh, listen, we need a permanent guitar player. Um, uh, we need a permanent guitar player. And I said, um, do you mean you want me to audition? He said, no, the job is yours, do you want it? Bloody hell, yes. So I take the job. A bit later, I say to Mark, everybody, every guitar player in the country wanted this job. How did I get it? And he said, well, 
a few people recommended you. Nick Kershaw recommended you. Julian Mendelssohn, who was an engineer that Mark had worked with. Two or three people recommended mended me. He said, and then one evening I came in from the pub and I turned on the TV and I said, that's the guy everyone's recommended and that's how I got the job. So that was an enormous turning point and it was an enormous learning thing is that you never know. You never know what's going to lead from one place to the other. And sometimes you think it's a shit gig, but it turns out to be the biggest break you ever had. I tell you, my father was a carpenter. <coughs> so he built me uh, an electric guitar. He, didn't, he never made an instrument before. So he copied the neck exactly off of the acoustic guitar. And he, he asked me what shape I wanted. So I saw a picture in a book of a flying V. So I drew a flying V. But in order to tell him what the dimensions were, I wrote a line down the side and a line across the bottom to say what the dimensions were. And instead of a flying V, he just made a solid triangle. So it looked like a heavy metal balalaika, right? So uh, that was my first electric guitar. Yeah, it must have started when I was making um, uh, the album I made with Robert uh, called A Scarcity of Miracles. And uh, I got introduced to Gavin and um, then when, when the Crimson Job came up, they said, uh, you know, we'd like to make you a special guitar now that you're in Crimson. And we chatted about what that might be. <clears throat> and I chose the neck and I chose the scale length. And I said, it'd be great if we could put the cover of the first album on. So they made this beautiful custom uh, private stock guitar with Pizzo in the bridge uh, and it all goes to blue and then there's a, if you turn it round, you never see it because it's against my stomach, but there's another figure from the inside of the original gatefold sleeve on the back. And um, while we've been touring, lots of fans ask, we do a kind of meet and greet thing where you talk to, to, to some of the fans and quite often people said, is there any way you're ever going to manufacture a, a version of this guitar that we can buy? So that came up and they, they discussed it in America and they said, well, uh, you know, the other one is so expensive to make and a pain to, to, to create, but putting the transfer on. And the, so uh, we talked about the idea of doing a, an SE version, which is what this is. So it's, it has a sim, you know, still got the image, but it's got a black sunburst. There is no pizza, but we put a coil tap in. But it, and apart from that, it's the same, it's a solid mahogany instrument with a rosewood fingerboard. And, um, and it plays great. No, not really. I, the trouble is the current lineup of Crimson, there are three drummers down the front. So I can't use a conventional amplifier. No, none of us can, because the first thing that would hit would be three lots of overhead mics. So we're all using, uh, I currently use a Helix, uh, multi-effects. Uh, and the other great thing about the Helix is that um, I've got two outputs, one for the Pizzo, and, but there are two inputs into the Helix, so I can treat that as a completely separate sound source and tweak it and then save it as a patch, so that's great. I use two pedals within it. I use uh, an Electro Harmonics Mel 9, which is a Mellotron pedal, and I use that on some of the big, heavy Crimson riffs because I use the Mellotron brass, mix it with the guitar, um, and I, uh, I use a, uh, a Digitech frequency pedal that creates a feedback because I've got no amps or anything. I, I, have, to, uh, I have to fake it. Um, the most important thing I would say is be lucky because without luck you're going to get nowhere and don't be an asshole.